Oh, uh, we're joined by Nia Hodges, recent graduate of uh, Jackson State University, and we've got a room full here of our STEM students here at Velma Jackson High School. And we're recording this for all the STEM students in Madison County Schools and also our friends at Luther Branson Elementary, Shirley Simmons Middle School, Germantown High School, Old Town Middle School, and Madison Middle School. So uh, we thank you so much for joining us. I know you've got a presentation for us and we got some great questions from the students we're gonna get to. But first of all, congratulations on your, on your recent graduation from Jackson State. Um, but I know you're very passionate about this, about this subject area and it's so needed for our young people to know this stuff. So I'll let you uh, take it away here. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm Nia Hodges. I recently graduated with a Bachelor's of Science in Computer Science from Jackson State University. Um, a little bit about my journey. So before I got to Jackson State, I really didn't realize what I was interested in until my senior year of high school when I joined the robotics team. Um, I, I was always interested in math, but on the robotics team, I realized while I wasn't a big fan of building the robots, I really enjoyed programming them. So that helped me decide um, what I wanted to major in in college. And um, during my freshman year of being at Jackson State, I applied to this HBCU Invitational. Um, what I've learned with at least my HBCU is that they're always sending opportunities. And so this was something I randomly applied for. Not really sure what it was. I thought it was more so of like a tech talk, but they ended up flying us out to Washington, D.C. and offering us different internships. So um, that happened the, my, the fall semester of my freshman year, which led to my first internship with Northrop Grumman the summer of 2020. Um, and then I became a research assistant at my school in the computer science department during the fall semester of my second year. And I, I completed that for two years. Um, I'm still a research assistant, even though I've uh, graduated, I'll continue with them this summer. And then my second internship was with Periton summer of 2021. This was actually a reoffer or offer to come back to North of Grumman. They ended up selling the sector that I was working for to Periton. So I, I interned with a new company, but it was a result of the first internship, which was a result of my computer science department sending us these different opportunities. Um, then I had a third internship this school year, this past school year. Um, with NASA and Lidos. This was an internship that was also um, a result of my professors um, recommending me to the company. So um, I really, I, there's been so many opportunities that have came from Jackson State. And I think that's a trend with a lot of HBCUs. They send out so many emails, you just have to apply. So I did that this past school year. And I recently graduated with a bachelor's of science in computer science. And this summer, I will be interning with Lockheed Martin, um, another major um, defense company. Yeah, we had some Lockheed Martin speakers from Atlanta earlier this semester, and they were incredible. Yes, I, I believe, I think I'll watch that video. Um, yeah. I think Lockheed Martin has always had a big presence on our campus. Like every career fair, they, they, they did a, a week with us during my freshman year where we worked on resumes and um, practice different interview um, interview tips and stuff like that. So I've always seen their presence on our campus. And so I'm really excited to work with them this summer. And after this internship, I'll begin my master's in data analytics and statistics at Washington University in St. Louis. So that's my journey so far. Um, and then I wanted to um, hit on kind of the things I've learned from the different internships and just being around a lot of professionals um, in this field, specifically ones that look like me that have influenced me. So the biggest thing is you have to be able to fail fast. And I know that's a popular phrase um, in this industry. You have to set your pride to the side. I remember um, during my first internship, I was scared to ask for help. I really wanted to um, know everything and being the only, um, being one of two females and the only black person on the team, I really wanted to um, represent our culture. So I was scared to ask for help. But once I realized like you have to fail fast, the smallest, I had the smallest issue. All I had to do is ask for help. So that's a big thing. You have to be able to um, ask for help. You need to be teachable. 
um, because you'll always be learning. Technology is always improving and you'll never know everything. So always be teachable. Um, you need to be reliable. Um, 80 to 90% of the work you're going to do is on the team. You're never just working alone. So you want to be able to be accountable and people need to be able to know that you can um, hold your own. And then the last thing I think um, in regard to skills um, from what I've learned so far as a student is that you really need to be inquisitive. Um, you're solving, you're trying to solve a lot of complex problems. So you need to be able to think critically. A lot of the- Never get it right the first time. That's why I've had all these speakers and these kids want to rush through stuff and it's not right the first time they want to quit. I'm in any type of STEM field, it is almost never right the first time. No, it's not. And it's, it, it can be, um, it can, it can, you at first, it can be a little discouraging when you don't get it right the first time. But once you do get it right, it's so much more rewarding than if you were doing something that was super simple. So I think um, the critical thinking um, that this field requires, it, it only makes you grow. Absolutely. Okay, and then, so in regard to computer science or the future of computer science in regard to education, from what I've noticed over the past three years is that um, languages like programming languages, they're always evolving. So they might uh, create a new one or they might create a new iteration of an old one. And so you're always, again, learning and you don't have to learn all of the languages once you figure out what you're interested in, you can focus on a specific type of language. So the second point about um, it being such a broad field, computer science is very broad. So that means there are a lot of different paths. So there are a couple of examples such as you know, software development, data analysis, web development, all of these different paths, you're gonna use different languages. So for me, I, um, I, I focus on data analysis and I'm interested in data engineering. So the languages that I have taken the time to learn are Python and a language called R. But there are so many languages to choose from. It can be kind of intimidating. So um, once you kind of get an idea of what you're interested in, you can figure out what language to focus on and you never really have to master it. You're always going to have resources. You're always going to have the internet. Um, not saying like you don't have to know anything, but more so you're, there's, the community is so big. There's so many resources and so many other people that can help you and teach you free resources, free websites. Um, and I'll cover those in the next point. But that's in regard to computer science in the learning it. Um, there's a lot of opportunities and there's a lot of different um, things that you can try to um, expose yourself to. So if you don't know what path you want to go on, of course, you probably don't. I, I'm still figuring it out and I just graduated. So um, that's why I love that, you know, the internet is so open and we have these resources so that we can teach ourselves in our free time, as well as further our education um, in colleges or certifications or different programs. Okay. Um, and then these are just different technologies that I use currently and will continue to use as a computer science student. Um, I know in one of your um, uh, classes you talked about, or um, you all talked about Windows versus MacBooks. And I remember when I graduated high school, I asked for a MacBook for my graduation gift. I always wanted one. And I loved it. You know, it's really sleek. It's, it looks good. But then when I realized the field I was going into, most of the applications I needed ran on a Windows computer. So I had to I had to adapt and I love it. Um, it's definitely my work computer, my school computer, but it, it has so many more capabilities. Um, and if you already have a MacBook, there are different applications that you can use on that like virtual boxes so that you don't necessarily have to go out and purchase a new computer because that is definitely expensive. So yeah, they're all uh, watching you on a MacBook right now and it definitely has its pros, but uh, to be successful in any type of technical field, you're going to have to know multiple operating systems. That's just a reality. I don't care what area you're going into. It's just, it's just true. Yes. Yes. All of my internships, I've had to use um, some form of a Windows computer. So um, unless you're going to work for Apple, then yep. um, you'll probably be using a, some, some type of Windows or Linux um, device. And um, you will need to learn how to navigate those, um, but they're strong and, and you know they, they have a lot of capabilities. So with my Windows computer, everything I use is 
free um, because I, I'm, I'm not going to pay for, you know, the big uh, software just yet because I'm still learning. So all of these are free and all of these can be accessed by you all. You all can download them um, in your free time. But one thing I use a lot, um, they're called integrated development environments or IDEs. This is just basically the space where you'll do your work. So this is where you can code and um, try out new things, new personal projects. And I've starred some of the ones that I, I suggest that you would start with because they're, they're easier to navigate, um, easier to set up. And I won't read everything to you all. Um, you all are intelligent, but you can see I've started Google Colab. That is an IDE through Google. Um, most people have a Gmail. So if you have a Gmail account, you can access or Google Drive, you can access Google Colab and it's easy to work with people um, because you can share the notebooks. And then in regard to websites um, for different tutorials and references, these are the websites that I stick to. Code Academy is my best friend. Anytime I wanna start learning a new language, I go there. That's where I learned Python. They have um, free courses and you, you try it out. So it's not like you're just reading an article or reading a book. It's you, you, you're, you're coding. So, um, and then if you want to take it further, they have options to get certifications and um, a lot of other projects that you can add to your portfolio um, as a student. So I want to backtrack when I was on the robotics team, I was only on it for a year, but I was competing against that were younger than me. They were in middle school, they were freshmen, and I'm a senior and I'm just now learning. And that's me. I joined late, but I realized um, a lot of those kids that are in middle school, they know as much as me because I'm, you know, new to this. And I can only imagine how strong they're going to be by the time they're my age. And I think that was um, a product of the school system I was in. I was in a predominantly white school system back in Alabama. And so they did have um, a lot of resources for those kids. So coming to Jackson, I've worked with a couple of different local schools. And if they had the same resources as those kids that I was competing against in my senior year, I can only imagine, you know, the types of things that they would be doing. So all of these resources are completely free. They don't require um, a big budget or anything like that. And I think it definitely um, will give you all a leg up if you're interested in computer science or programming or game development or anything in that sense. Um, all of these are free. YouTube is my best friend. Um, any of these um, applications that you're seeing on here, they, they look a little complicated at first, but YouTube has so many tutorials and things to really explain um, the basics. So don't feel intimidated when you, um, if you download Visual uh, Studio Code and can't figure out how to even set it up. You know, YouTube can teach you anything and it's free. So um, yeah, that's the that's basically what I use now um, for the work that I've been doing and the work that I've done in the past. And if y'all have any questions, um, I'm, I'm ready. Yeah, uh, well, well, first of all, uh, that, was, that was really interesting stuff. Um, uh, now, one thing, you know, I, I do want to talk about Jackson State a little bit. Um, you know, you came from a predominantly white school and then you did the HBCU. Now you're going to a PWI grad school. So uh, I, I like getting different perspectives on this because obviously we have people that have done different paths. So what do HBCUs like Jackson State have to offer that maybe PWIs can offer? And then what does the PWI offer that maybe HBCUs cannot? Okay, so in regard to what HBCUs have offered me um, in comparison to some of my friends and family that currently go to PWIs is that there are so many opportunities. Um, a lot, when I talk about my journey and the different internships and things that I've been able to do, it's a product of professors that saw me and saw potential and sent me those opportunities. All I had to do was apply. So I think with an HBCU, they really wanna see you succeed and they're gonna give you every opportunity. You just have to take it and apply. Whereas, I'm sorry for the background noise. Whereas for some of my um, other friends, I have a friend that goes to um, Belf Haven. I have another friend at Millsaps. When we talk about um, our career, when I tell them about our career fairs and the different job, uh, companies that come and see us, um, they wish they had that. 
because a lot of companies are, are coming to HBCUs to find the best of the best in, you know, our, our space, our culture. They're, they're meeting us where we're at versus us having to apply online and, and chase them down. So I think um, my number one, um, the one thing that my HBCU has given me is opportunity. One thing I noticed with some other um, PWIs, um, bigger schools, where I'm from, we have the University of Alabama. They have a lot of resources um, in regard to their labs. They have a lot of technology already there. So those students, they, they have um, firsthand, they, they get to work with some technologies and, um, and softwares that the schools pay for. So they have um, that experience when they are applying to these different jobs. So I think with a PWI, depending on the schools, they might have some more resources. So you might, you might get more hands-on um, work there. And then with an HBCU, there's a lot of opportunity for you to get that work or that experience with companies outside of the school, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, and but that's not to say, because we had Dr. Jessica Murphy in the fall from Jackson State, who just talks about all the, the new technology available right there in the meteorology department at Jackson State. And that's just mind blowing, all the yes. stuff we have over there. And that's a, you know, that's a big STEM area. Now, I mean, to have a 3D weather simulator, that's pretty dang cool. Um, but, uh, but also we'd be remiss if we did not talk about your MPAC experience. Um, being a Delta Sigma Theta, and we have four here on campus that are uh, teachers that are Delta Sigma Thetas, and I've always been a big fan of this great organization. Um, now, and we've had some AKAs, and they're a great organization as well, but we haven't had any any Deltas that have talked about it. So, you know, I always tell these kids, you know, they see the strolling and the strutting and the colors, and, and all that's fun, and the step shows are great. You know, I've, I've been to a few step shows in my life. I actually judged one one time, too, but um, uh, and all that's really cool, and it's a great part of the culture, but there's so much more that these organizations do and that they offer. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about your experience uh, at Douglas Sigma Theta at Jackson State? And if you know Jariah Knight, she's one of my former students um, at Raymond High School. She was a Douglas Sigma Theta at Jackson State as well. And she also benefited from it a lot. Yes, I do know her. And um, okay, so my experience has been one filled with growth. Like there, it's fun, the strolling, the parties, all that is fun, but as a member, you're held to um, a different standard. You are automatically considered a student leader. You have to represent not only your school, but the organization um, in a different light. So I think being a member, I've been a member for two years now. Um, it's definitely brought me out of my comfort zone. I used to be a terrible uh, public speaker um, and I've, I've had to speak. I've had to host events. I've had to um, also learn how to budget and plan for um, different events in regard to educational development and um, international awareness. So I think the, the fun part is, is, is focused for um, collegiate or an undergrad experience, but you're a member for life. So they, they're really teaching you how to carry yourself as a young woman or a young man if you are interested in joining a fraternity. And they also teach you just um, how to, they teach you the importance of giving back and serving your community. So you're given this uh, platform and this opportunity to um, wear these letters and represent what are you going to do with that? So now, um, you know, you go back into the community, you you help the people that helped you get where you are. So I think um, I've, I've, I have a new appreciation for service. I have a new appreciation for social action. I, I registered to vote my freshman year of college before I joined, but I, I, I had never really understood what it really meant to have, have you know, the power in our vote. I never really understood that phrase until joining and how one person can make a difference. It, you don't have to have um, a title. You don't have to be um, a, a political giant. You, you, your voice matters. And I think that's one of the biggest things I have taken away so far from being in my organization is that it only takes one person to make a difference. So yeah, and 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 you know, and, and I know that, you know the kids see the strolling and the the letters and the jackets and stuff, and, and that's so cool. But there is so much more to it, and it's just good that the uh, you know that those opportunities are there, and there's also scholarship opportunities that Delta Sigma Theta and the other Divine Nine provide. Um, now. Um, you talked a little bit about, you know, you, you've learned to lead events and to speak in public. Now, I, I'm not camera shy and I never have been, but I know everybody's not like that. 
Uh, I, I've spoken in front of 2,000 people before, and I was fine. A again, everybody's not comfortable with that. But how important is it to be able to communicate to a group of people, especially in your situation? You said, you know, you'd be the only one of only the only females, the only minority in the room. So it is even more important, I would say, for you to be able to uh, be able to articulate ideas, to be able to speak to your audience and to be able to be a valid communicator. These kids get so mad at me when I have them present. And I'm not doing it to be mean. I'm not doing it to make fun of them. But, you know, those along with the technology skills, which obviously are always changing and have to be learned, if you can't uh, give it to a group, it all means nothing. So how important are those uh, uh, communication skills that you've learned uh, throughout your college career? It's So it's been extremely important, I think, in regard to computer science and being in a field where there aren't a lot of people like us. You are definitely representing your entire culture when you're the only one on the team or the only one in the room um, and it might not be your choice but you want to set a good example so you want to be able to articulate your ideas also when you're working with people who aren't in your field or who aren't as um, knowledgeable in what you're presenting you can know everything in the world but if you can't explain it or teach it then you know, how, how does it become effective? So being able to talk to a customer that um, wants you to build a, a certain application for them, if you're talking at a very high or low level and explaining all the details they and they don't understand, you know, what you're talking about, they're not going to get the picture that you're trying to show them. So it's, it's definitely important to be able to articulate what you're trying to um, say and put on a, a good show like you, I don't, I feel like I'm rambling. It's, oh, you're fine. it's, it's really important that, you know, you carry yourself in a way that um, could, would make your, I would say, make your parents proud. Yeah. So I think um, you'll have to do that in the classroom. You'll have to do that in your career. And then in our um, different organizations, we have to do that because we're representing something bigger than just ourselves. Like I'm representing Jackson State at the moment. I'm representing Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. I'm representing my family. So I think you're more than just yourself when you are given um, a platform and when you're given an opportunity to do something. Yeah, and especially at Lockheed Martin. You know, I mean, we're talking billions and billions of dollars of government contracts. The government's not going to pay all that money if they don't know what they're getting. So obviously you have to design a great product, but you also be have to be able to pitch that to your customer to say, look, here's what we made for you. Here's how it works. Here's what you're getting in return. Uh, yeah. Now give me $2 billion. So, uh, <laughs> and so it, that, that is such an important skill, but I do have some great questions from the kids. Um, and this first one, you talked a little bit about this, but this is Reginald Cooper and he's in 10th grade. And he asks, how hard is it keeping up with all the constantly evolving coding languages? Yeah can be difficult if you are trying to learn a lot at once. So once you kind of figure out what you're interested in, then you can focus on that specific language. And it's not it's not difficult then. But starting out, I was trying to learn every other language because I just, I wanted to feel like, you know, I was the best of the best. And I know at Jackson State, in our classes, they start us off on a language called C++ which is kind of difficult. Um, it's very, uh, it's the syntax is very particular. One missed, you know, comma and the whole code won't run. So that's, that was something that, you know, made me feel like, is this really for me? Um, so if, if, you, if I was telling someone to, who was trying to start off what language to start with, I would tell them, you know, start with Python or another high level language. And when I say high level, I mean, um, it's readable. It's, it's, English versus um, a lower level language would be um, less readable. It would be, um, you really need to know what each line of code means. So I think you don't have to learn everything. And so once you pick one and just try it out, once you learn one, it's easier to learn more, but I would just say pick one and focus on it and perfect that. Yeah, and it'd be the same as, you know, if you're learning a, a verbal language, I, I would, not, you know, it's hard to learn, uh, German, Russian, and Japanese all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just, just learn one and go to the next one. Uh, this is Jay Ashton Williams. He's in ninth grade. And he asked, do you ever have a feeling that you were out of place going into, going into your career? No, I don't. At this point in my life, um, when I was a freshman in college, I definitely 
um, didn't know why I was there. I kind of just picked something. They said computer science pays well. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll work with that because I liked math, but I wasn't, I didn't know, I still don't know exactly what I want to do. So I think um, it's a, it's a learning curve. It's an experience. I feel like you just have to step out on faith. And if something doesn't feel right, you know, you can change your major, you can try different classes, different electives early on so that you're not necessarily wasting time. But even, even after getting a degree, there are people who are, you know, far into their career that decide, you know, this isn't something I want to do for the next 20 years. And there's so many resources where you can learn something new, you know, in the blink of an eye. So it's not as, it's not restricting. So. Yeah, and, and a couple of weeks ago, I had a speaker from, uh, from Alcorn and he's a, he does the server down at the uh, Department of Revenue, and he, he's a big hardware guy. He has a computer science degree from Alcorn. Now, obviously, he's, he's a little bit older than me, so he said, obviously, technology has changed so much. So I remember almost nothing that or I use almost nothing I got with a computer science degree, but it did, me, it did give me that basis of learning that helped me keep up with the changing technology. And he's worked in multiple areas of IT with, uh, with that first degree. And it's like you said, IT is so broad. Once you have that, have those basic skills, you can work pretty much anywhere in the technical field. And also, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, if you know we have young people that maybe don't want to do the four-year college thing, they could get the certification at our community colleges and get into the field at 19, 20 years old, start working, and then go to school part-time and get these degrees while they're working full-time. Yes, and I, I definitely think you know certifications. There, there are coding boot camps. There's a lot of different paths, and I think. So my dad used to tell me, um, he would say smart people shouldn't have to pay for school. And I don't, I won't say that's <laughs> for everything, but in reality, like in the STEM field, yeah. you, you, you don't have to pay for school. If you, let's say you, you get a, uh, you go to a two year or you do get a bachelor's and you want to further your education, you don't have to come out of pocket get a job with a company that has a plan already in place to where if you decide to further your education or you want to change your path, they will pay for it. They will fund it. So there's a lot of money in STEM and in research to where you, you can literally learn and do anything for free. So. Yeah. And then we're, with you going to Lockheed Martin, the military also has a lot of uh, technical pathways if somebody doesn't want to do the college route. Because in the Air Force, they're getting you know the latest technology to train on. They do four or five years. They've got the skills. Lockheed Martin or somebody would hire them right out of the military because they've got the training and the experience on that already. So there are multiple pathways to get into these areas. Right. That is true. Um, this is a, a Trevion Blackman, and he's a, a, in ninth grade. And he asked, what is, the, what is your favorite thing about what you do? My favorite thing about what I do, I honestly love not necessarily teaching. I don't know if I'm going to become a teacher one day. I'm still figuring that out. But I, I love explaining what I do to other people yeah. so that's kind of broad but it's it's I'm passionate about being able to um, take data and understand it and make a picture out of it um, I'm focusing on data science and I think whenever I'm explaining it to someone that isn't in that area or that field um, and their eyes light up when I describe the different um, ways you can use data to solve problems um, I did a, a research symposium at Jackson State this past fall semester where I was presenting um, my research on taking data from a water a pseudo water distribution system and showing how someone could attack the water distribution system. So imagine if somebody could shut the water off in Jackson, that, that would be a huge you know, attack on the city. And that's something that could be preventable just drawing that picture and and making the case in the scenario to someone and them understanding like wow like okay you could you could you know prevent that by you know using this and data and and this algorithm and when they understand it then i i get happy because i understand that I, now i feel like i'm doing something important so i think that's my favorite part is is showing why it's important or why it matters yeah i just got one more from the students and this is amaya dixon and she's a ninth grade and she uh you know, she's one of our top students, wants to go to college, wants to do the whole MPAC thing. But she's asking, uh, is it hard? Is it, is it hard pledging and focusing on academics? 
it can be. I, I think the biggest thing is to remember why you're there. Um, you're there for school Absolutely. and joining the organization is a plus. It's an opportunity. Um, and it's not by luck, but it is, you know, you're, you're a student first. So I feel like if it becomes more important than, you know, your classwork, you, you can't even do anything. You know, if your GPA is too low, you can't be a member, you can't be active. So I feel like if you remember your purpose and being there and remember your why, it won't be that difficult. But if you let the parties and the strolling and the social aspect of it overtake, you know, your whole reason for being there, you're going to be there for five, six, seven years, you know, trying to still keep that work. Uh, yeah, because every school's got the super seniors, you know, the six, seven years, and, and, they, and they never yeah. leave. And then, and then they complain about they can't pay off their student loans. So I was like, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I think student loans are crazy, too. But, you know, you're the one that was in school seven years. So that's not that's not all in the government. That's on you, too. Um, yeah. uh, but we're almost out of time. And thank you so much for joining us. And congratulations again. And you're going to love St. Louis. I, I've, I've been there. Uh, a few times myself. So, and my favorite hockey team is in St. Louis. I try to get up there when I can, but before we go, um, you know, and for, first of all, what an impressive resume that you have and just so much uh, good stuff you're doing in the community. And it was great to read about you uh, on the news, but you know, you're uh, you're not much older than these kids and you've grown up in the South as a, a young black woman. So um, uh, with all these kids that are going to be in the same situations and the same obstacles that you faced, what can they do to overcome those same obstacles that they're going to face at some point? It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. I think in regard to the obstacles I've faced as a student or as a Black woman in tech? Uh, both. Okay, so in regard to some obstacles that you're going to face as a student and as a Black woman in tech, honestly, my biggest thing that I tell myself is, or I ask myself is, you know, what's your purpose? And you're going to have more than one purpose. I've realized you'll have a purpose at your school. You'll have a purpose in your organization. You'll have a purpose whenever you get to your job or if you take a different track. And once you focus on your purpose and your, your reason, um, you can let a lot of things um, slide. So if you're, you know, in a room full of people that don't look like you, you know your purpose and you know why you're there. Absolutely. If you're in a classroom where everyone seems to be smarter than you, you still know your purpose and you know why you're there. Um, I think coming from a predominantly white uh, school system in Alabama to an HBCU, I, I really struggled with finding myself because back home, I was known for being, you know, smart and I was one of the only black girls in my class. So I already stood out. Then I came to an HBCU where everyone in the room is smart and black. And now it's like, what else do you have to offer? Why are you here? And so once you really um, figure out, you know, what, why, why does God have me on this track? What, what can I um, accomplish here? What can I change here? Then that'll help you. That'll order your steps. And so that'll help you really um, figure out what you want to do, why you want to do it, all of that good stuff. So that's awesome. Well, the STEM queen, Nia Hodges, thanks again so much for joining us. And congratulations, you know, everything that you're going to get and that you've gotten, you, you definitely deserve. And uh, best of luck to you in St. Louis. You're going to love that city. It's a great place. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Talk to you soon, my friend. Bye. See you.